Okay, let's get into it. So we started a series. Um, it's going to last all summer long. Um, we're going to take a pause break for July 3rd so we can eat hot dogs and eat desserts. Okay. And, uh, but we're going to continue on with this summer series called Spirit Wars. Um, just kind of just by a quick shout, how many guys have purchased this book and are following along with it? I said, shout, not raise your hand. (laughs) All right, good. (laughs) Shout. Right? What does that mean, Gene? Yay. Let's just give a yay in sign language here real quick. Come on, everybody. Yay. Jazz hands. So we started last week of the introductions, kind of introducing what we're going to be talking about. Today I want to talk to you about fighting for peace. Someone say fighting for peace. Fighting for peace. I I don't know about you, but do you guys, um, this happened to me. I'm just going to be extremely transparent because that's the only way that we're going to really talk about stuff today. Because let's just face it, like a lot of us deal with a lot of stuff, right? Come on, somebody. Right, and we just have to learn as a church just to be open, transparent. Yeah, there's risks of getting hurt, but you know what? The risk, um, it it weighs less than the victory that you're going to get. And so I just want to encourage you that during the next summer months that you learn to become a little open, transparent before the Lord, maybe even transparent with others. And let's see what God can do internally to heal our heart, our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions as we kind of journey off. Because what's happening nowadays, especially in today's world and culture, is that the culture is trying to tell us who who we are, right? It's trying to um, uh, shape and form an identity for, I'm not talking about um, transgender, homosexuality, none of that stuff. I'm talking about just identity in general, right? We're just, we're we're, we're being, we're being conditioned right now to, to, to shape ourselves the way that the world and the way that the enemy sees us, and therefore we listen to that, and therefore we try to live according to that. I want to encourage you this morning for the rest of the summer, don't listen to the world, okay? You are not like that. You are saved. You are set free. You are no longer a sinner because Christ died for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. And if you believe in that, you are set free. That's who you are. That's who you are. You are a powerful person, right? You are somebody who carries the presence and the anointing of Jesus Christ dripped all over your life. Someone say, I'm dripping, baby. You're dripping. Check out my drip, homie. Every now and then I get a little OG, you know what I mean? Like, but I remember growing up, we're going to talk about fighting for peace. I better get into it because I'll just start going off on a tangent. I remember growing up living in in an atmosphere, a culture of fear. Anybody with me? Like, I just was kind of afraid all the time. I, you know, a lot of these things, the reason why I kind of lived this way, my mind was geared this way, is I introduced a lot of things into my life that were not positive. Um, for instance, um, at the age of, I believe it was like five or six, I was watching The Exorcist. Okay? I, I would never watch that now, but if I watched that now, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, that's some cheesy G, uh, CG stuff. Like, that's just, uh, it wouldn't even phase me now, but... At five and six, now, now, granted, it's not like my mom and dad said, yeah, go ahead and watch that. It's okay. No, 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 no. We're talking like I had to sneak around, you know, I'm going to go spend the night at so-and-so's house, and then we'd watch that. And then, so I just introduced these things into my life at a very, very young age. And I remember just constantly having this fear about my life. I used to actually uh, see, and this is no lie, don't judge me, Okay. Um, Because what what we'll discover is that I I bet you anything that most of us are more supernatural than what you think you really are, right? And so I remember seeing demons in my room. (laughs) Uh, What do they look like? Well, my brother. No, I'm just like. (laughs) I remember remember seeing uh, red eyes appear in my room. I remember whispers. While I was sleeping, I remember my wall actually coming alive. And I saw handprints coming from my wall. Um, 
I remember as I was growing up to try to get away from the fear that I would actually sleep with a knife under my bed. Um, because, you know, a knife will kill demons, right? So, uh, and I remember, I remember um, uh, getting in the closet and emptying the closet on top of myself so I could hide away from anything fearful. I would say I was pretty bound by fear. I was pretty wrapped up in fear. You know, and fear is a big deal. Someone say fear is a big deal. Fear is a big deal if you're controlled by it. Fear is a big deal if you're controlled by it. And we see that today rampant in our culture today where there's a lot of fear happening on. Why is that? Because we're being fed by our culture, a.k.a. media, a.k.a. TV, that everything is going to hell in a handbasket, baby. Like, it's just going bad. There's this war. There's this happening. There's that happening. There's nothing ever that, that is glorifying Jesus. It's all driving fear because of an agenda that is leading us. And that's why I'm talking about your identity. It's called control. I'm not necessarily talking about cultural control or media control. Forget that. I don't care about politics. It has nothing to do with politics. I'm just talking about the spirit that's behind it. And the spirit that's behind it is the spirit of fear which wants to control your life. It wants to control your life. I remember having multiple encounters with God that reassured me he was with me. I remember feeling the presence of Jesus at a very young age. There was one time in my church back in Las Cruces, New Mexico, Back then it was called First Assembly of God Las Cruces. Remember I was sitting at the steps of the platform. I was about 11 years old. Everyone had left the sanctuary. God was just moving on my heart. So let me just stop and pause and let me just say this right now. I don't care what the world says about kids right now, there's hope for our children. But what they really need is not just another lecture of who they think they are, what they really need is an encounter with Jesus. And let me just say something to us this morning as the church, that we're responsible for that encounter. So I remember sitting at the platform of these steps here, and no one's around me. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm just crying. I'm about 11, 12 years old, and I'm just crying. I don't know what it was, but God just got a hold of me. It wasn't nothing special. There was no special evangelist. It wasn't. I just remember sitting there at the, at this, the steps, and, and I felt this breeze right by me. Now, normal, normally, we would think, oh, that's just the air conditioner. But air conditioners don't smell like roses. <laughs> I felt that I actually had the presence of Jesus walk by me. And a breeze went, it just went like this. You know how you can tell when someone walks by you? It just went like that. And when that left me, the rose of Sharon followed it. And I smelled this smell. I was like, I, I like literally stood up and I was like, who is playing a joke on me? You know? See, all these encounters, again, you are more supernatural than you think you really are. See, we're not humans having a spiritual experience. We are actually spirit beings having a human experience. And we need to learn to connect with Jesus. We need to desire and expect to connect with the presence of God. But even with all those experiences, it seemed that my life was a roller coaster of bondage and victory when it came to fear. Fast forward, I got married to Kristen. And in my mind, someone say in my mind, in my mind, I used to get thoughts in my head that she was going to die, that she was going to get in a car accident, she was going to get mugged by somebody. It would cause me to be extremely anxious. Now, all this is just playing here in my mind, right? None of it actually really happened. But isn't it interesting that the mind is where the battle usually happens? The mind of control, right, the control of the mind, especially when it comes to the, to the, to the, to, to, to the spirit of fear, right, it controls what you think. And when it controls what you think, if not self-controlled by the Holy Spirit, we tend to act on those things. So therefore, that's how we get anxiety, you know. And anxiety is all these thoughts in our mind that really aren't real, but they feel real here. 
cause me to be extremely anxious and worry, and I would call her. But I'd be, like, obnoxiously calling her, you know. Hey, are you okay? Everything all right? Is your car okay? Like, just all the time. Now, different seasons in my life, same emotions. Fast forward now here just a few years ago when COVID hit. <clears throat> when COVID was this new thing. Everybody remember that? <laughs> Right? The world stopped, man. It just went boop, and it just stopped. I was walking my dog, Baxter. Oh, I miss my puppy. Right? I was walking my dog, Baxter, and out of nowhere, I'm telling you, out of nowhere, I get hit with a panic attack. Now, I've never had a panic attack in my life. I don't know what I was experiencing, but what it seemed like was the walls were closing in on me. Could anybody relate to that this morning? Like, it just seemed like the walls were closing in on me. And, and I had a, I was breathing really heavy, like really fast. And, 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 and all these thoughts started coming to my mind like, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die because of this. You're not going to see your kids have grandkids. You're not going to see them graduate. This was happening. This was happening. I mean, just thoughts, 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 thoughts flooding my mind. And all I was doing was walking my dog. Right? I mean, just out of nowhere, like a boom, like a landslide just hit me. So right in the middle of the sidewalk, while walking Baxter, I just, I didn't lift up the arm with the leash because that would be weird. Baxter would be praising the Lord too. And so I lifted up my hand right in the middle, and I said, God, this is not from you. And I just began to sing out loud right in the sidewalk, right by, right by the YMCA field where I live, down Riders Club Road, right? And I just started worshiping him. I started worshiping him, and it was like peace came over me, and, I, and, and then this voice came to me, and I believed that it was an impression, and it was the voice of the Lord, and he says this. He says, Jake, you will not taste death until I return. And I went, oh. I'll tell you what, one word from God can transform your life. One word from God can set you free. And I want you to know that ever since that happened, anything that's out there going, oh, this, oh, monkey pox, Right? All this kind of stuff. I just go, you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm not going to taste death until I see Jesus, until he returns. I have a foundational word from the Lord. Now, I know that doesn't happen for everybody the same way. But what I'm here to encourage you to do is point your eyes and your intention on Jesus. Because he's the only one who can set you free. See, we live in a world where demons and the demonic influence are trying to capture your attention to take your eyes off of Jesus and keep your eyes on yourself. That's what's happening in today's world. And during that time, I turned my eyes to Jesus and began to praise him. And that's what set me free. So let me encourage you here today. You may be walking through a battle right now. You may be going through something that is really you're struggling with. You don't have an answer for. You can't seem to find what's going on. You can't have the right feeling about it. Whatever the case is, I want you to know that in the middle of your battle and your trial, you lift up your eyes and your hands to Jesus. Don't stop focusing on the King of Kings. You worship him in the middle of your business. In the middle of your trial, in the middle of the wilderness, you put your hands up. I don't care if you have to do it physically. I'm telling you right now, do everything you can do to turn your attention to him. Turn your attention to him. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says this, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of, say it with me, power, love, and self-control. You see, fear is a spirit. You guys hear? Let's say that together. Fear is a spirit. Remember I said that you're probably more supernatural than you think you are. Fear is a spirit. And sometimes we think we might be going insane. But really what's happening is we're just listening to the spirit of insanity. We're just listening to the spirit of insanity. Not all your thoughts are your own thoughts. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Not all your thoughts are your own thoughts. I believe that evil spirits actually do talk to you by giving you their thoughts. That explains why in the world would I just be simply walking my dog Baxter, not thinking about anything, and then out of nowhere hits me like a train. Boom. I believe that I was under attack by 
the spirits around me, by the enemy around me. And you see, one of the tactics of the devil is that he'll give you his thoughts and then accuse you of having those thoughts. That's what happens. He gives you these thoughts and then accuses you of having those thoughts. Because what's his main purpose? His main purpose is called the accuser of the brethren. And he'll do anything he can do to bring accusation against you. See, and the enemy wants nothing more to keep you bound to the prison of your own mind. He desires nothing more to keep you there so you can question God and his sovereignty and his love for you. Understand this, that this tactic from the enemy is he will make things sound so understandable that we start to question God and his word. It sounds something like this. The enemy sounds something like this in your mind. See, I told you that God doesn't heal. And then what do you do? You start feeling bad for thinking that God doesn't heal. He puts thoughts in your mind, and he accuses you of having those thoughts. You see how tricky that is? He puts thoughts in your minds like this. You're not as good of a Christian as you think you are if you have those thoughts. <laughs> man, I hate the devil, man. No, literally. I, I really, I can say, hate some strong word, and I know exactly what I'm saying. Right? That's why we have a thing called the KJV 66. 66 rounds for the Bible. You guys are tracking with me? Right? It's called the Word. And each one of those things are ammunition against the enemy. Another thought that he plants in your mind and accuses you for having him is, you have to be the one to do all the work for your own salvation, for you to feel better. God's not going to help you. God's not going to help you. The other one that I've struggled with before in the past is, no matter what you do, you're still insignificant. No matter what you do, it doesn't matter. Now, I'm going to raise my hand to that one because I've identified with that. I've identified with that lie. That no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. Who's going to listen to me? Who's going to listen to old, old Pastor Jake, right? Who's going to listen to me because, you know, well, I'm not as old as the other pastor in, 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 in the town, so I'm really not as wise as some other people. So I really don't have a lot of stuff under my belt. Well, you know, I don't think 45, 46 is that old, but it certainly isn't that young, <laughs> Right? Oh, well, somebody's just a little bit more studious than you. Oh, they, they went to school for speaking, so they actually speak better. They can relay the message a little bit. Come on, these are real things that happen inside of me. I told you I was going to be transparent, right? Look at you trying to lead that church. They don't want to follow you. <laughs> these are all thoughts that the enemy loves to come. And I'll just use me as an example, Okay. I'm the guinea pig. You fill in the blank. These are all thoughts that the enemy comes and speaks to me and then accuses me for thinking that I'm thinking those thoughts. And I'm telling you right now that we have to continue. If we want peace in our life, we have to continue to transition and keep our eyes focused on him. Why do you think that our mission here is to host his presence and transform the city? Because I'm not interested in anything else but the presence of Jesus and winning souls for Jesus. That's it. There's other people who are interested in other things. That's why we have the body of Christ. But I'm here to tell you right now, as your pastor, my main objective is for us to create an atmosphere for God to be welcomed. I don't know about you, but I sensed and felt the presence of Jesus here this morning. It's one thing that I prayed for. It's one thing I was expecting. See, but all these thoughts, these are voices of demons that work around you. And I don't believe that Christians can be demon-possessed, but I do, however, believe they can be demonized. And the things that we open ourselves up to can and will lead to these types of influences, battles, and distractions. And these voices will continue to rob you of your peace. They'll continue to be the thief of your joy 
and of your peace. If we allow those thoughts to keep them here and entertain those thoughts. And that's what I'm trying to say when the culture is trying to tell us who we are. We need to look to the word of God. We need to look to the word. Reggie, give me your Bible. I usually have a Bible up here. I just don't. I'm not even reading out of Job, man. <laughs> you know, Reggie pretending over there. Yeah, Pastor, good job. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, man. I'm messing with you. <laughs> we need to define ourselves with what every verse in this Bible says about you and about me. Therefore, I am not my own, but I am his. The life I once lived before is no longer me. Come on, somebody. That's how you need to define yourself. And when these thoughts, here you go, Reggie. Oh, I closed Job. Sorry, man. It's, it's easy to find. Page 126. So, We need to learn to define ourselves and identify with what the word of God says, but not just the written word of God, but learn to identify and define yourself by the spoken word of God. When he speaks to you, how many of you guys still believe that there's a voice of God that wants to talk to you? He wants to talk to you. He wants to make the word, written word of God come alive by the spirit of God inside of you. Amen. So, what do we do? First, we have to start renouncing those little critters called demons. We got to recognize that they're, a, they're, a, they're, they're there to influence and attack us, right? We have to look and recognize that those things aren't from God. Those thoughts that I had on that day walking on the sidewalk with my dog Baxter, those were not from God. And we have to recognize that they're not from God, right? They're not from God. And let me encourage you today. As a matter of fact, let me empower you today that you have the authority to cast those demons out of your life. You don't need an exorcist. You, don't need, you just go before the king of kings and the throne of thrones and you go, Jesus Will you take these thoughts and these demons out of my life right now? Because those, those little voices will keep coming back to you. See, you are an addict. See, you are this. He tries to define you of you are, you are, you are, you are. But when we bring that to Jesus, he says, no, this is who you are. This is who you are. So we get to bang, renounce and kick those little demons out. I get tired. See, it's, it's, it's a mistake to maximize the devil in our lives. But it's equally a mistake to minimize the devil's work in our life. Because he is real. And he is looking for people who he may devour. And you know who he devours? He devours the one who always questions God and sovereignty of God. He goes, ah, target number one. I'm going after you first. Recognize the enemy. Recognize the devil when he says you're always going to be that way. And you say, uh-uh. See my pinky. See my palm. Poof, be gone, baby. No. I reject your voice. I need a t-shirt that says that. See, the only power the devil has over your life is the power you allow him to have. It's called the power of agreement. And when we find ourselves agreeing with the enemy, we will see ourselves living out in defeat. See, agreement goes both ways. We agree in prayer, amen? amen. We agree in prayer. But unfortunately, in our thought life, in the, private, in the private portions of our life, we actually agree with the enemy. And I'm here to tell you right now that the only power that the devil has this big, he's only this big, right? But the only power that he has over your life is the power you, the power you give him to agree with him. That's it. So let me encourage you to turn off their voices. Stop surrounding yourself with negative influences who get you thinking the way you do. I haven't watched the news in forever, right? The other day I turned it on and had this thing going on. I was like, oh, great, another thing. Another thing I can get wrapped into 
with lies and hypocrisy. That's exactly what I want to do. Hey, let's just leave that on. Let's just binge that for a little bit. No. Turn off the influences in your life and begin to focus in on Jesus. And even more practically than that, if you notice that you're starting to, that you feel down and you feel this way, maybe we might have to turn off literal, practical influences in our life. What kind of things are we watching? What kind of things are we listening to? What kind of voices are we entertaining in our minds? Begin to shut those off and turn your attention to Jesus. See, God's blueprint and desire is that you live in peace, even in the midst of turmoil and not understanding. Golly, if I can write a book about this, I'd be a billionaire. Why doesn't God do things for some people and doesn't for others? Someone go like this, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand why somebody can get healed, but the person praying over here, the same exact prayer isn't getting healed. I don't understand. I don't know. I don't know. We could come up with a list of reasons. Well, you know, brother, there's sin in their life. Or, you know, I just don't have enough faith. Or, you know, whatever the case is. The reality is, is that it's a mystery. But being okay in the middle of mystery is okay. Don't let the devil try to tempt you into thinking that it's not okay. Don't let the enemy say to you, because you don't understand, right? Don't let him say to you, oh, you don't understand. That means you don't have faith in God. That's not true. That's not true. God's blueprint and desires that we live in peace even when we don't understand. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, in order to have peace that passes all understanding, we have to surrender our understanding. We have to surrender our understanding. If you don't know, you're in a great place for peace. I know that's not the answer most people want, but it's the one that you find peace at. Being content with him. See, that key of surrender is the key for peace in your life. Living a life of surrender before the Lord puts him in the captain's seat. And it's so easy for us to rationalize and come up with reasons why God? Why God? But sometimes God doesn't want us to have a why, but he simply wants us to trust him. He wants us to surrender our emotions, our thought life, and our reasons. I go into this a little bit deeper in the study this coming week. I talk about what your, what your soul is. Your soul is comprised of three compartments, your mind, will, and your emotions. Ah, oh, but you got to watch it to find that out. I'm not going to tell you right now. We have to give him and surrender those things to him and simply just trust him. And trust only comes in the posture of surrender. Trust only comes in the posture of surrender. See, there's a story in the Bible that tested the peace of the disciples. If you can, turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. That's where you want to go, Reggie, okay? Okay, all right. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Man, I should have been a comedian. No, not really. Not really. Maybe I am. Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27. And he says, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. So the boat was being swamped by the waves. I love that word, swamped. You ever been somewhere where you just feel out of control? Yeah. I love that word, swamped, because that's how we identify as our life sometimes. Man, I'm just swamped. You know what I'm saying? Right? So the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he, meaning Jesus, was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, save us, Lord. We are perishing. That would totally be me. You know, because I'm so entitled. Don't you care about us, Jesus? Look, look what's going on. I'm being swamped by storms. You don't care about this? And here's Jesus taking a good nap. I think sometimes we just need to be like Jesus and take naps. Save us, Lord. We are perishing, verse 26. And he said to them, 
Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the man and the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? You can play some music back there, Denis. You can play some music back there. See, here's Jesus. He's at the bottom of a boat. I want you to picture this, okay? Use the area of your brain called cinema, and let's develop a story. So here's Jesus at the bottom of the boat. They're setting sail to go across the way, but they have to take the boat to get there. Right, you can turn that down just a tad. And so... The winds, they set sail and everything's good. It's kind of like when you're going to go fishing and everything's great and then it turns really bad, okay? And so they set sail, everything's good. They get about midway and the waves start coming. Isn't that just like life, right? Everything seems pretty cool, man. We just coasting, baby. We're just riding the wind of the sails. Come sail along, come sail. That's a song somewhere. We're not, yeah, sticks. We're not going to sing it, okay, Tracy? I know you want to karaoke this, but. And so here's the, the, the boat, the wind picks up. The wind starts rocking back and forth. The waves pick up, starts splashing into the water. The water hits the side of the boat. The water comes inside the boat. And the disciples go, oh, man, we've been here before. We've been here before. And the last time I was here, my boat sunk. Haven't you, don't you feel that way in life sometimes? Right? I, see, they didn't have Jesus the first time it happened, but most of us have, and we go, we go, man, Jesus, I remember I prayed to you that one time and you didn't show up. <laughs> I remember when I cried out to you, but the waves are overcoming me and you weren't there. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Come on, I'm speaking to someone's heart today. I can, I can feel it, right? So here's this boat rocking back and forth. All of a sudden, they just had enough. They came to their wit's end. They, they did everything they know how to do. They did everything they know how to do. And I don't want to focus on Jesus saying, oh, you have little faith. That's not what I want to focus on. We can create a message that way rock. They did everything they wanted. They cast out this buoy. They did this. They put down that. They, 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 they lowered the sails. They, they did everything they know how to do. Come on, isn't that like your life sometimes? Where we do everything we know how to do. We do everything we know how to do. And their last resort was, Jesus, save us. Save us. See, if you have peace in anything outside of Jesus, make no mistake about it, it will be tested. If you have peace in the, I've done everything I can do, if you have, if you found your peace before in, I've done this and I've done that and it worked, I promise you, there's another wave that's bigger that that's not going to work because it will get tested because it will get tested it will be tried and your boat will rock again so here's Jesus they wake him up he comes out I don't think Jesus was a grumpy sleeper if it were me I'd be like why I was having the best night. I was having the best sleep ever, guys. Why are you bothering me? I mean, I was just, it was like being rocked by my mom again. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Right? Jesus calmed the storm and came out, stood on the deck and said, peace be still. And you see, Jesus wasn't rebuking them for the lack of faith. 
but he was rebuking them for their lack of authority and peace they were actually living in. God sometimes in our lives allows our boats to be rocked so that way we can recognize and identify Jesus in the same boat with us. Notice, he wasn't outside of the boat. He was with him inside the boat. And I suggest to you here this morning as I close, you only have authority over the storm you can sleep in. Let me say that again. You only have authority over the storm you can sleep in. You see, peace is not dependent on what's happening in your surroundings. It happens when you have peace in your heart. And peace is the only thing that can cause the waves to stop. Even though they may seem rocky, even when you come out and say, peace, be still, when you live from a place of peace, And it's the reason why Jesus could sleep at the bottom of a boat. Because he was not determined by the surrounding of what was happening to him. He had peace in his heart. So let me encourage you here this morning. That in the rocky parts of your life right now, in the swamped part of your life, in the parts where it seems overwhelming, let's not try to swim our way out of it. Let's not try to get out of it, but let's find peace in the middle of it. The Bible says this, that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because you are with me. Because you're with me. See, fighting for peace doesn't mean doing everything you can do to get peace. No, it just means simply having confidence and resting in the prince of peace. That's who that is. That's how you fight for peace. Because your situation may or may not change. But what's in your heart definitely can transform. Finding peace in the middle of your trial. Because that's where Jesus is. He's right smack dab, right in the middle of it. So I'm encouraging you today, take authority of your life. Take authority over those demons that are speaking to you. Take authority over those demonic voices that are speaking and influencing you, telling you you're no good. Telling you that you'll never amount to this. Or telling you you'll always suffer from that. Or telling you that's just the chronic pain that you're going to deal with. Telling you that God doesn't heal anymore. Look, look at me, look at me. Jesus is still in the healing business and I refuse to believe anything differently than that. Well, we haven't seen it. We have, we just had somebody get healed of an intestinal problem last two weeks ago, two Sundays ago. Here, right here. They got prayed for, next thing you know, boom, totally clear. Jesus is in the healing business. And he wants to heal your body. He wants to heal you physically. Even us old people, like me, who wake up in the morning and hear different cracks and creaks every time you wake up. He just wants to add the grease to the knees, baby. He wants to heal you. Don't let the enemy tell you any differently. Don't let the devil tell you that you can't overcome that thing that you're battling. Don't let him speak that over your life. Because your Bible says that you're not just an overcomer. Who are you? You're more than an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. Now, you're just not a conqueror. You're more then a conqueror through Christ. That's how he sees you. So I want to pray for your peace in your situation. Right now, see if you can bow your head, close your eyes. One thing we're going to tackle, and then I'm going to ask if there's anybody here who doesn't know who Jesus is. 
that you just agree with tonight and today in prayer that he will save you. But the first thing I want to tackle is this. Nobody looking around. Is there anybody here this morning that says, Pastor, I'm going through a business right now. I'm going through thoughts in my mind. It's a battle right now in my mind. I, I somehow find myself questioning God's sovereignty. I find somehow questioning God's authority. I somehow find myself not having peace internally. If that's you, can you just raise your hand? I'm not even going to look. If that's you, can you just say, that's me, Pastor. Pray for me. I'm not even looking. And I want you to repeat this after me as I'm praying as well. As my hand is raised as well, say, Jesus, help me. I want to see you in the middle of my trial. Father, be the peace in my life that I need because I know you are with me. Now, we're going to speak to this situation. We're going to speak to this situation. It's an exercise I want you to practice. And I wish that I can say it only takes one jab, but it might take multiple. So think of your situation. And I want you to say this with me. Everyone out loud together. Say, situation, circumstance, you are not allowed in my life. In the name of Jesus, by the power of his spirit and his blood, I command you to be gone and to align yourself with what he says. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, powerful message. Yep, fighting for peace. And um, we just want to inspire you guys, man. We want to give you guys hope. Uh, and that's what Jesus does, is give you guys hope. Fight for peace. Yes, uh, every one of us has an area in our lives where we either struggle right now with lack of peace yeah. and anxiety and fear and insecurity with economy, inflation, and everything else. Yeah. or we remember time when we didn't have peace. Or we know someone who needs to hear this message yeah. more than ever. Yeah. Either way, you and I have a, a, a part in this. Yes. I have to deal with my peace, yeah. and I have to share the message of peace with someone who definitely so needs it. So good. Yep. I was just gonna say that. I yep. mean, right there, sometimes we need um, help, and that that's why this is so important. Yep. That's why this fellowship is important. That's why a, as much as you can, uh, leaving the comfort of your car, your couch, wherever you're watching us online and joining us in person because uh, we can bring peace to each other. Mm -hmm. Also, we can inspire each other. You can uplift me, sharpen me. Fighting for peace is so huge because, man, we, we're all human. We have a lot of stuff that goes on in our life. And then yep. on top of that, yes, add the worldly things on top of that. And it can be overwhelming sometimes. So we have to fight for peace. That's a daily battle to wake up every day and go, yep. I choose peace. Yes, exactly. I choose peace over my circumstances, over my situations. Yeah. And I'm glad that Pastor Jake didn't call it uh, getting peace mm. or obtaining peace. But, yeah. I, but as you alluded to the same thing, fighting for peace is a daily battle because things naturally go from order to disorder. Things naturally go from peace to fear and uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to fight for the peace in my home. I have to fight. Mm to remove the distractions and the obstacles and all of the voices of the media and of the enemy and of my flesh yeah. in order to gain access to the throne of grace and get peace with God, to stand on His promises and be at peace with myself and with my mind yes. that everything is going to be okay because of what Christ accomplished on the cross for me. So good. And all of those attacks are attacks of the enemy to distract sure. us from the main point, which yep. is getting closer to God. So Absolutely. Whatever he could use to yes. distract us, um, which is a battle for peace, uh, situations in life. Yeah, so good, so good. Yep. And, hey, if you've given your life to Jesus for the first time, first off, Mario and I and all the angels in heaven are celebrating that you've given your life to Jesus. Absolutely. It, it, that's, that's amazing. And we would love to get to know you, um, help walk you along those next steps, and one of the ways we do that is through a connect card. It's a digital connect card. You can take your phone out. You can hover over the screen with your camera on. 
and and that's going to take you to uh, a, a link that you can put out some information say hey check a box I give, I give my life to Christ and we would love to reach out to you personally one of our staff members here and pray with you answer questions you may have it's just a way to, for us to get connected with you and you to feel at home here because that's we are a big big family um, also a way to stay connected is through our websites um, our websites are at goriver.org or on our social media platforms as well so uh, we love you guys we thank you guys yep. so much for always tuning in with us uh, week after week or catching videos online and keep making this possible we're going to yep. keep doing this uh, keep fighting Absolutely. for peace fight for peace yep. um, every single day don't give up we love you guys we're here for you until next time we'll see ya peace see ya